Thank you so much. I'm directing your attention to the gospel according to Luke, chapter number 9. And I'd like to begin reading my text, please, with verse number 1. Then he, referring to Jesus, called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now drop down with me in the same chapter. I want to show you something in verse number 37. Same chapter. And it came to pass that on the next day when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried out saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he's mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him that he foameth again, and bruising him heartedly departeth from him. Now watch verse 40. I besought thy disciples. I, I got a hold of the ones in verse number 1 and verse number 2 that you gave power and authority to. I besought thy disciples to cast him out, this devil, this spirit. Here's what your Bible says. And they could not. Now, if I'm reading my Bible correctly, in verse 1 and 2, Jesus has just given them power to cast out, the Bible says, all devils. And 39 verses later, in the same chapter, they could not do what God had just empowered them to do. And that's always amazed me. With that thought in mind, I want to preach on the subject, if I can please, this afternoon, on the thought, the day the power went out. The day the power went out. When you read chapter number 9 of the Gospel of Luke, this is when Jesus is first sending his 12 hand-picked men out to preach the kingdom of God according to verse number 2. So Jesus shows us three things that qualifies a man to be a minister before God ever will send him out to be effective in the ministry. I want to show you those in verse number one as a means of introduction. Number one, if a man's going to have power and he's going to be effective for God, he's got to be called of God. The Bible says that he called his disciples. Did you know being a preacher and a minister is not a job? It is not a profession. What I'm doing is not a career. This is not my means of income. I don't do this to pay my bills. Mama didn't call me and Daddy didn't send me. I didn't put my name in a hat and see if I was the lucky one to be drawn out. I didn't sign up for the ministry. I got drafted into this thing. And if I wouldn't have been called by God, I'd have got out of this a long time ago because I've met the biggest fruit loops you'd ever meet in your life since I've been in the ministry. But the reason why I don't walk away, the reason why I don't slam my Bible, the reason why I don't give up on God is because he called me and he's faithful to them that he has called and put into the ministry. And this is all I've done for 45 years of my life is what I'm doing right now. So the first sign of a man that's been sent by God is he's called them into the ministry. Number two, here's what your Bible says. And he gave them power. Notice he gave them power before he ever sent them out. We have never had as much good, powerless preaching as we're having right now in the generation that we're facing. Good, solid stuff. I mean good teaching. Read verses right out of the Word of God but don't have enough power to knock the hair off a gander's snout when they stand in the pulpit. And I'm telling you, until a man gets the power of the Holy Ghost on his ministry, he's got no business going out and preaching. He's got no business pastoring a church. He has no business being a missionary. He has no busy being an evangelist. And you preachers better go back to setting these men down and telling them they're not qualified until somehow they get the anointing of God on their life. Because dead pastors produce dead churches. You understand that, right? 
and we scream about churches being dead, and they are, but many times it's not the people's fault. They have a dead preacher. He never spends time with God. He's never been anointed. There's a power shortage in his life. I was taught by Dr. Harold Seitler that there's only two reasons why a man mounts the pulpit without the anointing of God if he's been called. Number one, he is either in sin or number two, he's never really been called of God. God equips his men to preach with power. So don't come telling me, well, they say good stuff, they don't have any power. They don't have any business in the pulpit. Now look, when people come to church, they don't have a lot of rights. But one right they do have is to hear somebody get up on this platform with the anointing and the touch and the power of God and get plugged into the glory world and hear from another world. And when a man doesn't have an anointing, he's got no business. By the way, I'm not listening to him. I'm not going to bring him here. If a man ain't got no power, he ain't standing in this pulpit. I'll drag him out and throw him out the side door. I don't want to hear what he's got to say. I want to hear what God has to say. God calls them, and God gives them power. Now, isn't that what your Bible said? Now, look at the third one, because I'm going to lose some of you here. He gives them authority. It's not a position. It's a ranking. When I say authority, that doesn't mean that I believe he's above anybody else in the church. As a matter of fact, minister means to be servant. I am your servant. So I am the least among all that are here today. But there's something about a man that's got the call of God and the power of God on him. He has a voice of authority when he gets in the pulpit. You remember one time they went out to hear Jesus preach and they said there's something different about him. They said, well, what is it? They said, well, we don't know everything, but we know this. He's not like the scribes and Pharisees because he speaks with a voice of authority. There's something about him when he talks, he captures our attention. If I remember the Bible right, we're to lift our, up our voice like a trumpet. Bless God, not like a violin and a harmonica. But we... <laughs> I've never seen so many soft-spoken, just effeminate. I, I've never seen anything like it. And, and I'm telling you, I know everybody's not the same. and know everybody don't rip heads off and spit on you like I do. I understand you don't have to do that. But I don't want you twitching up here like my granddaughter either and doing your wrist like this and lisping when you talk. I'll tell you something, man. I ain't sitting under that kind of nonsense. You ain't getting up here in your little pink Bermuda shorts and your flip-flops and, and your necklace around your neck and two hairs on your chest super glued off the rear of your German shepherd. You're not preaching in this pulpit like that. I want somebody with some boldness about them. I remember when Peter, James, and John went before the authorities and they let them go. They said, I'll tell you one thing, they're ignorant and unlearned, but I'll tell you one thing I do know about them. They have been with Jesus. I'm going to tell you, I'd rather be so dumb that I can't read my name and I have the authority and the own and the God on my life than to be an educated fool and think that my, my, my intelligence is what gets the job done. I'll tell you what gets the job done. It's called the anointing. It's called the power. It's called the filling of the Holy Ghost of God. That's what gets the job done. Nothing else satisfies. So in verse number one, God gives him this divine power. He gives him power over all devils. And 39 verses later, a guy comes to Jesus and says, Look, my son, devil, I, I brought him to your disciples. And now they can't do what you said they had the power to do. So why did the power go out? This alarms me when I read this. Because these men that were handpicked by Jesus were good men. They were godly men. They were faithful men. They were dedicated men. And if that can happen to them, we better be ever so careful to realize, brother, it can happen to us, it can happen to our home, and it can happen to our church. The old songwriter wrote it down and he said it right. All is vain except the spirit of the Holy One come down. God doesn't need this little country church, but this little country church sure does need God. And I'm not settling for anything else than a touch of God to be on his house. So what happened that caused these men to sacrifice that God-given power from their lives and from their ministry? I notice right away that it doesn't take long and it doesn't take much to lose this power. It came as a result of getting their eyes off the main purpose of their calling. And I will deal with that in a moment. 
What in the world could kill the power of Almighty God in 39 short verses? There are some things in this chapter that I want to show you that I believe was instrumental in getting the disciples to the point where that power leaked out of their lives. Let me give you a few examples from the Bible. In verse number 7, they begin to talk about Herod and how John the Baptist went to hear Herod. And then when they told Herod that Jesus, the way he was preaching, Herod said, oh no, John has risen from the dead. So the ministry of Jesus must have sounded a lot like the ministry of John's. And they begin to talk about Herod. You know, Herod, he was, he was a political leader. He, he was involved in the politics of the land. And you remember Herod, his wife, wanted John the Baptist's head in a charger after a dance. And it was Herod that cut John's head off. So the first thing we got to be careful, and it's a needed thing, but we can't let it drain the power out of our church, is when we got to deal with political issues. And we have to deal with political issues. Uh, Jeremiah dealt with political issues. Isaiah dealt with political issues. Uh, Malachi dealt with political issues. Habakkuk dealt with political issues. The corruption of a country has to be exposed. A man of God needs to deal with the corruption of the country. And my God, if I dealt with the corruption of America today, I'd be in this pulpit six months and never repeat myself twice. We have never been in such a mess as we are in right now in this country. This country is in an all-time low. We got a guy in the White House that didn't know if he was running for Congress or running for president. He has not only signed for our tax dollars to go back paying abortions in America, he's also signed a bill that our tax dollars will pay for abortions in other countries. I've got to cry out against that because abortion has always been murder and it always will be murder and God will never change his mind about it. God will never change his mind about abortion. And I could get on politics, and it's got to be dealt with when when BLM and and all these fragments and and radicals can march in the streets and nothing is ever said about it. But yet they turn around and tell us we can't have church on Sunday because it's not healthy for everybody. You can go to Walmart. You can go to a strip club. You can go to you can go to a liquor store. You can go to a whorehouse, but you can't go to church because you might get the virus. I'm going to tell you, as long as there's breath in my body, they ain't a stinking politician. This side of hell going to shut down a mayor's of Kingsport. These doors will be open. These lights will be on. And I got news for the governor, the president, and everybody else. We haven't church. We haven't church. So there's a lot of political mess. It's just ridiculous. Somebody sent me a picture the other day of who the president has put into the physiolog, the, the, the health care thing. It's a man, woman, slash monster. I mean, it's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. If I went in that, and, and that was my doctor that came in my room, my blood pressure would go up. I tell you, they'd have to sedate me. If he if don't know he's a him or her, I sure don't know if he's a him or her, but I don't want them putting their hands on me. Oh, yeah, I'm preaching now. When I went to my doctor, he asked me about 4,900 questions. He got done, and he said, you got any questions for me, Brother Joe? We got the same doctor. I said, yes, sir, I want to ask you something. You queer? He said, that's a personal question. I said, putting your hands on my body is a personal problem. You ain't touching me. He said, I'm happily married with children. I said, bring it on, brother. Do what you got to do. But I'm telling you, it's everywhere we go. They're teaching this in our schools. They're teaching it in the junior highs. They're teaching it in our colleges. Everything that's philosophized against God is being crammed down the throats and the minds of our kids. And somewhere, once in a while, John the Baptist has got to come out of the wilderness with a bowl of honey and a locust in his mouth and raise literal hell about the nonsense. The White House has less respect than the outhouse. We need to clear that whole mess out. All of Congress needs cleared out. And we need to get some state running this country again. You sorry Republicans, you're so interested in getting reelected, you won't buck the tide of these bunch of devils that are taking over this country. Finally, we got some women with a backbone that got voted in this last election. They're saying what you gutless men refuse to say. Am I telling it right? 
But if you're not careful, we can get so involved with that that it can, it, it can pull our power from us. Revival's not going to come from the White House. It's going to come from the church house. So we must, be, we must be careful to keep politics in its place. In verse 12 through 17, I tell you, if you're not careful, problems can make your power leak out. It's there that Jesus is feeding 5,000 men plus their wives and children, and he's got two fish and, and five hush puppies. And it's a little kid's lunch, and that's all he's got. And the Bible said that God blessed it, and, he, and the disciples distributed. Now think about this. you got 12 disciples handing out Captain D's <laughs> to 5,000 men plus their wives and kids. Son, you don't think that wasn't a task to carry 5,000 plates to the men plus their wives and plus all their children? You don't think that didn't become a problem? I'll tell you how big of a problem it became. If you read the story in the Gospel of Mark, when they got done, Jesus said, go into the desert and rest a while and don't come out. They were so exhausted with a situation that they were trying to fix that they were mentally, physically, and spiritually wore out. And Jesus commanded them to go rest. You see, if we're not careful, situations will come into our life that we have to deal with because it's a problem that needs fixed. But you can get so involved in fixing other people's problems that you let the power of God leak out of your life, and thus the power of God leaks out of our church. Now, all of us face problems. Some of you are facing the problems of your parents getting older and having to take care of them. And my wife and I went through that for many years. And, and even on a good day, that's not an easy adjustment. We moved my mother into my house. That is not an easy adjustment. The old saying is true. There's not a house big enough for two women. There's no such thing. I don't give a flip how big it is. And here I am, a man surrounded by females. I have come in from three weeks on the road, exhausted from preaching revivals, totally dead on my feet, drive all night, walk in the house. Listen to this. My daughter's crying in her bedroom. My wife's crying in our bedroom. And my mama's crying in her bedroom. All of them over different problems. Now, if you don't think that won't make you want to back out the door and smoke a joint about that long and that big around, I'm telling you, it'll drive you out of your mind. But you know what you got to do? You got to deal with them problems. But if you're not careful, that problem will leak the power of God out of your life. Maybe you're having to make financial adjustments because I promise you the unemployment rate is going up. Hands down, you can mark that down. And maybe you're going to get into a financial situation. Maybe you're going to find out that your health is deteriorating. Maybe you've got cancer. You've got Alzheimer's. You've got kidney failure. Maybe you've got a kid that's gone bad. Maybe you're facing just depression and an emotional trauma that you can't even explain, much less talk about or understand the feelings in your own body. We all have problems that we have to deal with, but we must be careful that while we're solving everybody else's problems, that it doesn't take the power of God out of our life. That was one of the things that made them lose the touch of God. If you think you're a cure-all for everybody's problems, you are going to lose your mind and drive everybody crazy around you. There are some things only God can take care of. There are some things that only God can fix. And you've got to leave it alone. Make sure you keep the anointing of God in your life and say, it. Don't. I don't care what the politics do. I don't care what kind of problems other people get in. I've got to keep my focus on Jesus Christ. Am I making any sense at all today? Am I making any sense at all? The third thing we have to watch is found in verse 46. I call this prestige. Now watch this. Jesus just feeds the 5,000, and he heals this guy's son that's got a demon, right? The very next verse, he starts talking about his death on the cross. Jesus is talking about the sacrificial death for the sins of the world. And right in the middle of Jesus talking about prophesying his death, the disciples are whispering to each other. And Jesus stops and said, what are you talking about? And none of them wanted to say anything. He said, what are you talking about? And they said, we're arguing over who's going to be the greatest. All right, let me get this straight. We're all sinners. We should all be in hell. We're wicked on our best days. God saved us by his mercy and grace. Everything we are and ever hope to be is because of Jesus and Jesus alone. And we're dumb enough to sit in a circle and argue over who's going to be the greatest. I tell you who's the greatest. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. And there's none beside him. He is in a category all his own. He is in a caliber all his own. But see what happens is we, be, we begin to get prestige. And this can happen inside our church. 
because you hold because you hold a position or because you're liked by a certain group of people or because you can sing or because you're good in activities or you're good in administration you get to thinking that you're more important than somebody else in this church I'm going to tell you as the pastor some of the greatest members of this church are what I call silent saints you never hear a word out of them. I'm talking about the ones that scrub these toilets every week and never complain about it. I'm talking about the ones that's, that sanitize this auditorium every Saturday night so you can sit here in a clean environment on Sunday mornings. I'm talking about the ones that cut the grass all summer long and weed eat and make sure this place looks appropriate and clean. I'm talking about the ones that touch up the paint when everything gets scuffed up from you and your family running in and out. And I'm not complaining. I'm saying these have to be done. You ever thought about who changes these light bulbs? You know what it's like to get on a trifold ladder and go that high just to change a light bulb? Somebody's got to do it. You've never done it, but somebody else has. And you know who it is? It's people that serve Jesus because they love him and not because they want to be recognized. They don't have to call, you don't have to call their name from the pulpit. They don't have to have the limelight. They don't have to be in front of the show. They don't have to have a microphone. They don't have to have a party. It's not the who's who. We are all dust at our very best. None of us are better than anybody else else none of you are more important than anybody else I love everybody alike God loves everybody alike God put you here as a member we are fitly joined together we're here to worship we're here to praise him we're here to adore him we're here to give him glory that is due to his name and that involves everybody who do you think pulls the weeds up in our yards year-round I doubt any of you even know him and his wife's name but every week they're down here pulling every weed across this campus so this place looks nice. You don't even know who it is. But they're just as important as anybody else. Prestige. Be careful. Prestige will drain the power of God out of your life. Verse number 49, power struggle can drain the power of God out of a church. If you'll go this way and if you'll go that way, you want most of those churches are dead as a hammer. Let me tell you why. Power struggle. Deacons thought they were in charge. Somebody with money thought they was in charge. Some woman with a tongue that'll reach from here to that back door thought she was in charge. Somebody else thought they were in charge because their papa donated the brick and their tobacco spitting grandma taught Sunday school for 40 years. And all of a sudden, they feel like they have more power and influence than they do than anybody else in the church. That's why I don't have a deacon board here. I have a leadership team that I give full accountability to. That's with my morals. That's with my finances and every other area of my life. I wouldn't sit under a man that wasn't accountable. There's something wrong with a man that's fearful for being accountable. But nobody is putting a bridle on this preacher. You're not telling me who to have in the preach. You're not telling me what to preach. You're not telling me when to preach. And if you think your position gives you power, then you do not deserve to have a position in the work of God. We've got to be careful. We are working together. This is not a power struggle. I don't preach on pastoral authority every time I get in a pulpit. I don't have to. I'm not insecure. I don't need to do that. I'm not afraid to be questioned or challenged if it's proper and right. But God sent me here not to, not to run this church. God sent me here to keep you from running this church. And that's exactly what I'm going to do to the best of my ability. And I think my leadership team will tell you, if it starts any other direction, there's going to be hell waist deep in this place because I'm not putting up with it. No deacon board is going to get me off in the corner and tell me what's going to do next. We are a local assembly. Anything that's changed in this church will be voted on by the active membership of this local assembly. It's not going to be done in a secret room with just a handful of people. That's not going to happen. And by the way, while I'm here, if you hadn't been here in six months, you're not you're not come flying in here and voting on anything. As a matter of fact, if you've missed six weeks in a row without a reason, you automatically fall off our church row. You're not coming in here once every five years to toot your horn and let me know how powerful you are. We'll run your tail out that door. I'm not putting up with that nonsense here. I'm not a bridal. I'm not for sale. You're not going to control me. I'm not a sissy. I'm not a wimp. I don't need your approval. I can preach whether you shout or pout. I can preach whether you tithe or not. I can preach whether you leave here in a good mood or you squeal your tire. That does not matter to me. I give an accountable to one person, and that's Jesus Christ himself. And until that changes, you better come in, put both feet on the floor, make sure your seat belt's tight, because we're going to go for a ride through this book every single Sunday. I'm going to push you through the Word of God, and we're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And while I'm here, I'm talking about the King James Bible. There's no other version coming in this church. We're not having any other Bible in this church. 
There's only one Bible for the English-speaking people that God has preserved, and that's the one we've got sitting in our lap. And I'm trying to stay nice, but I feel a mean streak come at all. Power is something that will rob you of your place with God. So if it's not politics, and it's not prestige, and it's not power, and it's not problems, what is it that keeps the power in our church? It's people. People. The whole function of this story, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll read it, it all pivots around verse 38 and 40. A guy brings his kid to Jesus. I need help. What good is a church, no matter how big the auditorium, how beautiful the landscaping, how charismatic the pastor is, how good the praise team, what good is all of that? If the power of the Holy Ghost isn't in this building to help some wayward sinner when they find themselves struggling and come inside that door, it's going to take more than a song. It's going to take more than a chandelier. It's going to take the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, let me give you this in closing. People's where it's at. There's three kinds of people that we need to help immediately. Please don't get your eyes off people. Somebody came running in my office today and said, why were you late? You're never late. And that's true. I'm never late for anything. I don't like being late. If you're late, you need to call me and tell me you're late. Don't you leave me hanging. I don't like no-shows. I'll burn you alive. Don't you ever do a no-show with me. Call me. Tell me something's come up. But I was late because I picked a lady up for church today. Miss Laura got saved here not long ago, and she needed to ride to church. And my wife and I went and picked her up. No car, no family. Raise your hand, Miss Laura. You will always be welcome here. Always. There's three types of people we better keep our eyes on, and I'm done. Number one, somebody's hurting today. Can you imagine what it must have been like for that father to see his only son? He specified to Jesus, this is my only child, my only boy. Can you imagine the hurt of your only child going bad? He's begging Jesus, help me. I've been everywhere. I've done everything. I've even went to your disciples. Help me. I don't know if you know it or not, but behind the friendly handshakes and the beautiful smiles, we're sitting in a building full of people hurting. Somebody's hurting today. And when they come to church, there's something about the balm of Gilead. There's something about that anointing oil of God flowing over the house of God and through the hearts and lives of his people. It helps heal people that come here hurting. We're not here because our lives are all together. We've all got areas that are screwed up. But we're here because there's something about healing in the house of God. There's something about coming when you don't feel like it. And God healing that wound when you least expect him to. We've got to have the Holy Ghost here because people are hurting. We've got to have the Holy Ghost the anointing here because people are being haunted. When I read my commentaries, most of them agree that this boy was in his teenage years. He's torn already as a young teenager. He's battered. He's been bruised. And his life is already a total mess. He's suicidal. He's jumping in fire. He's trying to drown himself. Demons are possessing his body, flipping him on the ground, tearing him, bruising him, afflicting him as they enter in and out of his body. If you'd approach this young man, you'd see... Marks on his body, scars in his brain, and nothing but misery in his eyes. And he's haunted from his past. And everybody in this community has said, you'll always be like you are. Nobody will ever be able to help you. You even went to the disciples, and the disciples can't even help you. Your body's all scarred with tattoos. You've shacked up. You've already been a drunk. You've already been incarcerated. Look! Even the disciples can't help you. And here's a young man being haunted, thinking, is this really the way life has to be? I remember waking up in a mental ward one day. And I rolled out of bed, and I remember looking in the mirror. I was 15 years old. And I'd heard so many people tell me that I was hopeless. That brother branches for the first time when I was 15. I looked in the mirror and said, maybe I am. Maybe this is where I belong. They begged my daddy to sign me over until I was 18. 
And I thought, you know, maybe I am hopeless. Nobody's been able to help me. I've been to three psychiatric wards, was under psychiatric evaluations. Dr. Lyons was my psychologist. I'd been everywhere. I'd tried new leaves. I'd been to three dry out clinics. I got so many chips. I could start a poker game. Been to all the dry out clinics. I've been, man, I know that program. I, I can give the program. I know that stinking thing forward and backward. And no help. And no hope. And I would lay in bed at night and look at the tattoos on my arms and say, man, I'm one messed up dude. I look where I got stabbed and ripped open in a gang fight. And Brother Danny, I'd look at that scar where I got ripped open and almost bled to death. And I'd say, maybe there is no hope. The buckshot that's still in my chest where I was shot with a shotgun. Sometimes I thought, maybe there is no hope. And I would look at my face all battered and scarred and my body wrecked. And I'd lay in the floor at night on a quilt because I didn't have a mattress. And I'd say, maybe there is no hope. And I was haunted because I wanted out. I would beg them, get me out. I can't live like this anymore. And on November 21st, 1975, I picked up a pistol to try to commit suicide. And the phone rang, and it was my old aunt. And she said, I want to invite you to a revival. I didn't even know what that was. I... I knew it was something to do with church. I thought it was bingo because everybody plays bingo up north. And she said, we're having revival tonight. And I said, well, I hope you win. She said, Phil, I don't know why, but God told me to call you. I said, Aunt Laureen, I'm so hopeless. You can't help me. I'm so far gone. I'm facing 50 years in prison. How in the world are you going to help me? She said, just let me come by and pick you up. Me and Uncle Buford's in the car. She hung up the phone, and the Holy Ghost spoke in my spirit for the first time and said, you've been everywhere, and you've done everything. Won't you go down there to that little old church? I didn't know it, but Aunt Florine got in the car, and she looked at Uncle Buford and said, Uncle Buford, God's a real living man. He don't know it yet, but he's in trouble with God. And I'm glad that on November 22nd, 1975, somebody told me that Jesus bled and died for my sin. And I didn't have to carry the scars and the pain and the hurt and the unforgiveness and the abuse and that all of that could be gone. And at 15 minutes after 8, I stood to my feet, came down to the front before the first Baptist ever touched me. I'd already got into the family of God and got born again. And for 45 years, I've been telling everybody, I don't care how haunted you are. I don't care how your past is. I don't care what addiction you had. I don't care what failure you got. I don't care how deep your scar is. I don't care how long you've had the pain. There's bomb in you for those that are being haunted by their past. Those that are hurting. Those that are haunted. And I want to close with this. What about those that have gotten hard? Let me give you something to think about, Brother Mark. Isn't it strange that here comes a guy with a teenage boy that's totally gone crazy. And he comes to Jesus and said, now I've, I've brought him to your disciples and they can't do nothing. Now watch this, Brother Jamie. His mama's never mentioned in the story. I've often wondered, where's mama, Brother Derek? Where's mama? What, what, what mama? Is it not inbred in her to want the best for her children? What mama wouldn't want to get their kid to Jesus? What mama wouldn't want their son delivered from demons? What mama wouldn't want their boy to quit jumping in fire and trying to drown himself in water? What mama wouldn't be there because you see there's three types of people. Yeah, you got people that are hurting. You got people that are haunted. But sometimes you got people that's just got hard. It isn't a lack of love. They just get hard. See, the Bible said in the last days, the love of many shall wax cold. Is it, it isn't that they don't have love. It's just the love is wax cold. When wax gets cold, it gets hard, correct? It's not that the love is there. It's just that it's overlayered with something that's made it cold. Sometimes people have tried and waited so long that they just got so hard and said, you know what? I don't think anything's ever going to happen. It's just what it's going to be. And they die that way. I'm closing with this. I was at a meeting some time ago. And a lady came in with her husband. And I noticed he had her by the hand and... and Brother Nick, it was like she was a zombie, literally. And the first thing that went through my mind was Alzheimer's or dementia. You know, you've seen that before. That's what I thought it was. And I'll never forget it. The place was packed. The glory of God was in that service. And he brought her in and he set her down. And then he had to tell her to move over. 
and she moved over and all the time I was preaching she just looked at me with a stare like she really wasn't listening I didn't know the story I didn't even know the family at the time and about halfway through my message there was a big pillar in the middle of the auditorium and about halfway through my message that little lady that had to be led in by the hand brother snap she got up out of that pew the anointing of God had fell in that church people were getting saved people were getting right I'm preaching over folks screaming their way to God there's probably 800 people there that night I mean God is all over that place and that lady that had to be helped in got up and grabbed that center pole brother guy and she shouted until she slid down that pole like a drunk woman and sat in the middle of the floor of that building of course when service was over he came running right to me her husband and said brother kid did you notice my wife and I said I did I don't know you but I'm just glad you're here he said did you see my wife shout I said I did he said my wife used to do that all the time all the time he said six years ago our only granddaughter was graduating from high school and we decided to buy her a car for graduation so she could go to college and he said she was a good Christian girl she loved the Lord we sang together in our church and said coming home from one of her friends houses we don't even know why but she left the road and rolled that car and went down in a long ravine and laid there upside down for hours and when they found my granddaughter her face was so purple it was black where she had hung upside down and the blood had rushed to her head and my granddaughter died in the car that we bought her and my wife came to me and said honey maybe if we wouldn't have bought that car this wouldn't have happened maybe it's our fault he said honey you can't be like that she's a Christian we're Christians we're all hurting but you know God has a plan and we may not understand it all here but we will in the by and by and I don't know how to explain what happened but she's with the Lord and it's going to be all right she said no honey if we would have bought if we wouldn't have bought that car I'd have my granddaughter he said mr. kid for six years six years my wife gets up and gets dressed and sits in a recliner and looks at our granddaughter's picture on the fireplace mantle and cries all day long six years brother kid she has never spoke to me she has never cooked for me she has she won't eat a meal with me she has nothing to do with me we sleep in separate beds. for six years I've been married to a zombie but he said you were preaching tonight and there was such power I begged her to come. I got her by the hand. I said, honey, I'm taking you. You've got to get back under the spout where the glory is. You've got to get back to being what God wants. For six years, you've been nothing but a spiritual zombie. He said, when the glory fell in this church, I saw a tear running out of my wife's eye. I couldn't believe that God was ministering to my wife. He said she hadn't shouted like that in six years. When he said that, Brother Collins, you know what I did? I climbed that pole and shouted till I fell to the ground because I'm telling you I don't care how hard they are if they'll come to a church where the power of God is flowing God can break it down and revive them back in the house of God again let's give the Lord a head clap of praise wow these are the days of the